You want to support Roller March Unfiltered? Be sure to join our Bring the Funk fan club. Every dollar that you give to us supports our daily digital show. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real as Roller Martin Unfiltered. Support the Roller Martin Unfiltered daily digital show by going to rollermartinunfiltered.com. You can make this possible. Oh, folks, uh, New York City is having the mayoral campaign, the election taking place, and there are a ton of candidates in the race. One of those is the former HUD secretary under President Barack Obama, Sean Donovan, also former New York housing official. Uh, he wants to replace Bill de Blasio as the next mayor of New York City. He joins us right now. Sean, glad to have you on Roller Martin Unfiltered. Had you on Washington Watch on TV One several times, so glad to have you back. Many times. It is great to see you again, Roland. Thanks so much for having me on. All right, so uh, let's get right to it. Uh, so I'm sitting here. I've been crazy busy with advertising stuff all day. Uh, and then we had to, uh, so I'm seeing these stories, all the folks saying, wait a minute, what's this, all this stuff about housing and not knowing the cost of median housing in Brooklyn? What, what, what's, what's up with that? Uh, you know, we are having a, a race here in New York, Roland, that is about how to make housing affordable, right? This is the thing that I hear Every day, you know this, I've, I've spent 30 years of my career working to make housing affordable, and we've seen the last eight years under Mayor de Blasio an explosion in homelessness in this city. Uh, we've seen gentrification. We've so, seen so many things that are at the center of what needs to change and why we need new leadership in this city. And uh, that's the work that I put at the center of my, my career for 30 years, going back to growing up in the city and watching homelessness explode on the streets, watching the South Bronx burn, uh, and, and working with Bishop Johnny Ray Youngblood and the East Brooklyn congregations to build the Nehemiah homes. All of that is work that, that I've done that I think is so important at this moment when you're, you're exactly right, when housing is uh, at the center of what New Yorkers are concerned about. Gentrification is also one of those issues, and that's a problem issue that black folks have been talking about. Speaking of Brooklyn, uh, how the cost is shot up, uh, folks being moved out of areas, Brooklyn, Harlem, and others as well. And so, uh, as mayor, how do you deal with that? Uh, where, uh, let's just be honest, where you have uh, whites moving into areas that were previously occupy occupied by black African Americans and Hispanics, uh, all of a sudden you begin to see uh, new resources and new facilities in those areas, but for Folks who've lived there being priced out. How do you change that? How do you stop that? How do you fix that if you're mayor of New York City? Well, first, you got to make sure that folks can stay. And, you know, I mentioned a moment ago, I started my career when I learned about the work that Bishop Johnny Ray Youngblood was doing with East Brooklyn congregations in Brownsville and East New York. And what we did was build more than 5,000 Nehemiah homes that allowed folks to buy their first home. And if you go back and look after 30 years of the way that that wealth that they've built has not only changed their lives, but their children's lives, their grandchildren's lives, this is exactly why I'm proposing equity bonds. You know, some of my opponents in the race say we should give a, a few hundred dollars a month uh, to a few New Yorkers and that that's gonna solve poverty. I know that on average, a white family has 10 times the wealth than a black family does in this city. And that's why I'm proposing equity bonds, building on the work that Cory Booker did with baby bonds. What I'm proposing is that every child born in the city would get $1,000, and every year until they graduate high school, up to another $2,000 more. That means, it means a kid born into poverty in this city would graduate with almost $50,000 in an account to be able to buy a home, to go to college, to start a business. And it is really that wealth gap that is the primary driver of so much of the inequality uh, in the city. And, and that would certainly allow folks to stay in their communities and actually benefit from revitalization to make sure that, that revitalization happens with them and for them, not to them. And that's a, a cornerstone of what I'm proposing as mayor. What, what about uh, the issue that we're still seeing, the racial disparity in the top schools in New York City? That has been a point of contention. Uh, you've had uh, Asian parents, white parents, not happy at all with Mary Bill de Blasio, uh, who's been trying to diversify those schools. Many of these schools that used to have a significant number of black students, uh, now uh, those numbers are, 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 are low as all get out. And so uh, how do you deal with that? Because if you're saying education is the issue, 
the problem is if you're if you're black and Hispanic and you're getting shut out out of New York City's top public schools, you're in the same problem your parents are in. Absolutely. And look, uh, you said low is all get out, Roland. Let's be clear, fewer than 10 black students the last few years in each of the, the new classes at Stuyvesant. And that has to change. Part of this is we have to make sure that folks can live wherever they choose in New York. The segregation in our neighborhoods is a root cause of the segregation in our schools. And, and you know this, we talked about it a number of times. I led the work for President Obama on fair housing. And, uh, you know, I don't know if you remember, Donald Trump, when he still had a Twitter account, was attacking my work, saying we were trying to destroy the suburbs, racist attacks, because I was trying to make sure people could live wherever they choose. So uh, one foundational piece of this is solving the segregation and discrimination in our neighborhoods. But then we have to solve it in our schools as well. Part of this is really making sure that we are getting rid of the screens and tests that are screening out too many black and brown kids from the best schools. But also, we need to make sure that we're creating real opportunities for a more diverse set of teachers in New York. You know, Roland, all the, all the information we have shows that if you're a kid of color and you have a teacher of color by third grade, you're much more likely to graduate. And yet, in a system that's 85% kids of color in New York, we only have 45% teachers of color. That has to change. I've got a range of other plans as well that would do this, but we've got to solve this issue. There is no equity in New York without solving this challenge in our schools, just like you've said. Uh, speaking of schools, you've got a lot of parents there who are on waiting lists for charter schools. Uh, they want uh, to see uh, those slots open up. You've got folks in Albany who oppose uh, the expansion. Do you believe, are you going to listen to those parents, listen to the demand uh, and say and agree with the expansion of uh, high quality charter schools in New York City? Roland, I've said again and again, I'm for good schools. And just like you said, we're seeing real demand for charters in many communities, particularly black and brown communities. And we should not let politics stand in the way of ensuring parents can get uh, a good education for their kids. Let's be clear, we have some charters that are struggling too, and we ought to hold all our schools to high standards of excellence. But if there's demand and we're, sh we're seeing many good charter schools in New York, we ought to make sure that they're, they're available. But here's the other thing, Roland, I, I would really want to focus on. You know, the single most powerful way you can predict a kid's life chances, even their life expectancy in New York, is the zip code they grow up in. And so it's not just more good schools, it's making sure every New Yorker has within 15 minutes of their front door a, a, a great school for their kids. That's part of my 15 minute neighborhood plan that would fundamentally change the inequity in our neighborhoods. And I would make sure it's not just a school, but it's a great job to support your family, transportation, uh, the health care you need, get a COVID test, get a vaccine, deal with the underlying disparities in health that disproportionately devastated black and brown communities with COVID. So fresh food, uh, a park where you can exercise, all of the things that are needed for a life of health and opportunity, we should make sure every New Yorker has within 15 minutes of their front door. And that's a centerpiece of my equity agenda when I'm mayor. Questions, one question each from each one of my panelists. I'll start with you, Mustafa. Your question for Sean Donovan. Yeah, Sean, good to see you. Um, uh, my question for you is, you know, there are a number of environmental justice impacts that are happening in New York City. Uh, asthma is one example. Um, about 14% of the adults there, and of course, a great percentage of the young people, which creates its own set of challenges for folks. Uh, how will you begin to address some of the, both the environmental injustices that are happening and the climate crisis that New York has had to deal with, uh, especially with some of the storms that continue to get uh, stronger and stronger? Yeah, it, it's such an important question. And unfortunately, as someone who, who's led through crisis after crisis, I've seen this, that those who are the most vulnerable before the crisis hits are always hurt the worst by it. Uh, I saw this when I had to clean up the mess that President Bush had created uh, after Katrina, uh, when we started under President Obama. I saw it after Sandy. And what we need to do is make sure that we're leading with protecting the communities that are most vulnerable. This is what we did after Sandy. Public housing, so many different communities that were hard hit. 
and we need to make sure that we're removing the sources of pollution. You know, we know that whether it's toxic waste, uh, what we call the peaker plants, there's the gas fired plants in New York that surge on at high times of need, or just locating sanitation garages and other things that contribute to asthma. There's so many ways that we've disproportionately impacted communities of color with environmental hazards. And this is also part of my 15 minute plan. It's not just what you should have within 15 minutes of your front door, it's what you shouldn't have as well. And making sure that we're removing those hazards and really putting environmental justice at the forefront of our work on climate. Question from Kelly Bethayet for Sean Donovan. Sure, so I wanted to go back to what you do best, um, given your record, which is housing, um, specifically with income restrictive housing, for those who don't know, the way that I categorize it, you have like three groups. You have those who actually fall within the income restrictions. You have those who are definitely over the income restrictions and can afford the housing as priced. And then you have those people in the middle who are over the income restrictions by like a dollar and can't afford to live where they need to live in order to do what they need to do. So my question to you is, how do you rectify people essentially not impoverishing themselves in order to keep housing. Um, because there's a problem, I, I know there's uh, been issues in DC in which you have income restricted housing where if you make just a dollar over, you can lose the housing that you earned by way of income restrictions, but you can't afford to live where you are without that, uh, that safeguard in place. So how do you rectify being in that third group of people? Thing. Yeah, so first of all, one of the things I did as HUD secretary were pu push for ways that we could be a little more flexible to ensure that you didn't have that kind of uh, perverse impact on people. You know, earning an extra dollar and, and losing your housing assistance is uh, crazy, right? But what we also need to be doing is ensuring that we're creating real opportunities for folks to save as they earn more as well. One of the most, one of the programs I'm proudest of that we really uh, expanded dramatically when I was HUD secretary is called Family Self-Sufficiency. And basically the idea was as a resident of public housing, a resident of other kinds of affordable housing is earning more. Instead of just taking a big chunk of that uh, to, towards the rent because they're, they're earning more, put it in a savings account, allow them to build equity that goes to buying their first home. As I said a moment ago, there's nothing more powerful than the equity you can build through home ownership and wealth building. And that's something that we ought to make available to, to everyone. And it's something that I led as, as housing secretary as an important piece uh, working for President Obama that, that ensured we were allowing folks to build wealth and not have the kind of perverse impacts that you're talking about. So that full range of programs, a little more flexibility, but also the incentives to save, uh, be able to buy a home and then build wealth in the long term are critical to, to doing it as well. Next question, Ben. Yeah, uh, Mr. Donovan, um, Andrew Yang is under some serious fire today because of his statement on what's happening with Israel and Palestine, uh, particularly because it was endorsed by Ted Cruz, Stephen Miller, and I think even Donald Trump Jr. got in on it. Um, how do you distinguish yourself from his position and your thoughts on that particular position that he uh, put forth on Twitter? Yeah, well, look, we should all be horrified at the loss of life that we've seen uh, of Palestinian parents and children. And I will say as a, as a father of two young men, uh, I am particularly horrified to see the loss of, uh, of children uh, in innocent bystanders to this. And what I would say is this is not for political haymaking, this is tragedy. And mm. as someone who's worked side by side with President Biden, as someone who knows well uh, our Secretary of State. And I would just urge everyone, particularly our leadership in Washington, to work to de-escalate this situation as quickly as possible and make sure that we're saving lives. Uh, every human life is of value. And I, I think that has to come before politics here. Absolutely. All right, Sean Donovan, I certainly appreciate it. Thank you so very much. Uh, good luck in your run. 
Thanks so much, Roland. It's great to see you again. Great to be with you. Feels like old times. All right. Thank you very much, sir. Thanks a lot. All right, folks. Back to our Roland Mark Unfiltered video in just one moment. It's time to be smart. When we control our institutions, we win. We win. This is the most important news show on television of any racial background. Y'all put two, three, four, five, 10, 15, 20, 30 dollars on this and keep this going. What you've done, Roland, since this crisis came out in full bloom. Anybody watching this, tell your friends, go back and look at the last two weeks, especially of Roland Martin Unfiltered. I mean, hell, go back and look at the last two days. You've had sitting United States senators today, Klobuchar and Harris. Whatever you have that you have, you can bring to Roland Martin Unfiltered to support it. Please do, because this information may literally save your life. Watch Roland Martin Unfiltered daily at 6 p.m. Eastern on YouTube, Facebook, or Periscope, or go to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Support the Roland Martin Unfiltered Daily Digital Show by going to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Our goal is to get 20,000 of our fans contributing 50 bucks each for the whole year. You can make this possible. RolandMartinUnfiltered.com.